Hello, Lionesses. This is Bobby Carlton. I'm the publisher and editor in chief of Lioness Magazine, as well as the founder of Innovation Women. Today, I am talking to Rupal Patel. She is the founder and CEO of Vocal ID. Vocal ID creates custom synthetic voices using state of the art machine learning and speech blending algorithms. Welcome, Rupal. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Bobby. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Absolutely. Now, custom synthetic voices. Are we talking about like Siri and Alexa here? Yes and no. So I wouldn't necessarily call Siri and Alexa. Well, they're custom, but they're custom for all of us, right? So custom, what we mean is uniquely crafted, more um, diverse and inclusive voices. So really thinking about brands and thinking about who their listeners are and creating those voices for them. Nice. So before Vocal ID, you were a speech scientist. You were working in universities and clinical settings. Can you talk us through your startup journey? How did you make the leap from university to entrepreneurship? Yeah, so um, yeah, I'm a tenured faculty member at Northeastern University here in Boston. And, um, you know, I was going about my work and doing my research. Um, and part of that, actually, I started in academia for uh, along these lines um, as a, a speech language pathologist. So I was working as a speech language pathologist for some time um, and really was interested in new technologies, specifically uh, speech recognition technology and then pursued a PhD in the area. And then as I kind of learned more, I got really fascinated with technologies that are about speech and language but that could be used with people with speech disabilities. Um, so, you know, fast forward a little bit to 2013. You know, um, I had this project in the lab called Vocality and Vocality was trying to create a synthetic voice unique to an individual who had to use a device to talk. So take someone like Stephen Hawking or a child on the autism spectrum or someone who has cerebral palsy and has to use a device to talk because they can't use natural speech. Um, and what we wanted to do is create a unique voice for them that could sound like what they would have sounded like had they been able to speak. Um, so we were doing our work. And then in early 2013, there was um, a, a, a reporter from NPR who had approached me about this project. And it was actually on the, we had started this project in 20, uh, 2007, 2006. And by 2013, I was like, oh, there's all sorts of exciting other research happening in my lab. In fact, we we're making this um, reader uh, for kids who were learning to read um, that could kind of help them with inflection and so on. And so she asked me to you know, interview about this. We talked about it. Um, and then one thing led to the other is it led to uh, giving a TED talk at TED Women in 2000, late 2013. And again, you know, I was sort of, what I was doing initially uh, was presenting the research, the science behind how do you make a voice for someone who is unable to speak? And I, it still wasn't a company yet. It, the spark of like, could it be something was, wasn't really, hadn't really entered my mind. After I gave this talk, one of the last things I said in the talk was, what if you could donate your voice to someone in need? And we thought, honestly, maybe a couple hundred people would sign up and record seven to eight hours of speeches, which is what we needed at that time. And Interestingly, lots of people began to volunteer. And that was the beginning of the wheels churning to say, could there actually be something here? Could we help more than a dozen people that we could in the lab? Could we do more than that if this was actually a thing? You know, um, And I really didn't know quite how to do that. In fact, I applied for the Mass Challenge um, Incubator on, I think it was April 1st. I think it was like an April Fool's joke. <laughs> um, I had gone to see an NSF um, presentation, the National Science Foundation presentation about how you can start companies from science backgrounds. Um, you apply to these uh, uh, small business innovation grants and then those are allowed to, you can kind of commercialize your technology. So I, I went to the talk, that was interesting. That was the deadline for Mass Challenge 2014. Um, and I filled out, I didn't know what it, you know, what an elevator pitch was. It was kind of like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> uh, but it happened organically is what I'm trying to say. It wasn't sort of premeditated. I'm going to do this and now I'm going to go into it. And I think that's usually the journey for most entrepreneurs. 
Yeah. And I think that was around the time that you and I first connected. You were talking at that point about saving the voices of people who could potentially be losing theirs or had. And, you know, now it sounds like a little bit of your business focus has changed or evolved. Yeah, it's evolved. Yeah, I think it's expanded. So now that remember, that's like 2014, right? So the actual uh, beginning of the company was early 2015 when we got our first sort of um, grant from the National Science Foundation. Um, and that at that point, I took a leave from the university um, and sort of jumped into this full time. And um, it's, it's changed a lot. So the first three to four years, I would say, were solely focused on getting that technology and, and beginning to figure out how to productize it. So it was a it was research code. It wasn't even, you know, there wasn't thought given into how do you commercialize this? Mm-hmm. Or even the fact that in our in the lab, we never even measured how long or how much how much resources were necessary to create a synthetic voice. Um, it was probably hundreds of thousands for you know even one at that point. So our goal was to figure out how do we do this at scale? How do we in fact build a synthetic voice for each individual that's specific to them, but also do it at a price point that someone as an individual can afford, especially someone with speech disabilities when there's often other disabilities that are also things that they're working with, right? Um, And so that was a big challenge. Um, And by late 2018, we we had a process in place. Um, You know, by 2015, we were already starting to deliver some voices and so on. Um, And then what we started seeing is when I started the company, I knew if it was only going to be an assistive technology company, it was actually going to be a pretty hard battle, right? And so even back then I was talking about, but today we, you know, this is our beachhead. We're working with people with speech disabilities and that's often how major technologies get started. You start with something that's a big dire need and then you say, well, how can the rest of the world use this too? Mm -hmm. But when I was speaking about the rest of the world using customized synthetic voices in 2015, most people were just like, oh, I don't need my, or most investors I was talking to, I don't need my GPS to talk like my wife, you know, or something like that. So I think that so much has changed in the last five to six years along those lines. Yeah. So how do companies figure out, like, you know, how to move their technology into uh, a business? I think that's probably the big question that we would all want to ask yeah. you and and other entrepreneurs who are coming out of the technology. I mean, you know, for example, uh, voice of the customer is a term that we use in business to describe the in-depth process of capturing a customer's expectations and their preferences and aversion. Like you're talking about the literal voice of a customer here. Are you are you talking about something a little bit different? Well, okay, so maybe I can backtrack a little bit to say sort of how have we expanded. Mm. Um, So what we're doing now, and this really started late 2019, as you start to hear more and more things talking to us. So think about your Amazon Alexa, you know, uh, Google Home, all of these things that now have sort of a voice personality. And and there's an entire field called, you know, voice first technologies, right? So we're speaking more to devices and they're speaking back, back to us or applications. We're also listening to things a lot more than we're reading. Think about content. Most content we, we consume these days is through our ears, not by, by reading them through our eyes, right? And so the, the demand for voice has increased rapidly. So what we do at Vocal ID now is not only create voices for individuals who need them to speak for their daily communication, but we also create customized voice experiences for companies. So imagine you are a um, a bank and you have an interactive voice response system or a customer service application. You can't afford to sound like your competitor. You need to have a voice that's unique to you. So when I talk about voice um, of a brand, I'm really talking about the way the brand is speaking to its customers. And in the past, um, when brands thought about their voice, they thought about sort of one Uber voice for their brand. So they would hire a voice talent or a celebrity or somebody uh, that would be representative of their voice. So they thought about their brand colors. They thought about their brand logo. um, And some major brands obviously also thought about their brand voice. But it was sort of like the voice that everyone is going to hear. 
as we start thinking more and more about the diversity of voice around us, I think one interesting thing we need to ask is who's making that decision about the voice of that brand? Is it the brand or will the listener, should we be listening to the audience who's going to consume that product to say, well, how will we make that brand feel like there's a connection to their audience? And I think there, for certain kinds of brands, especially, it's really important that it's not just a product designer somewhere in the company that says, this is our brand. We also have to listen to the fact that every uh, every audience member is going to have different kinds of preferences. And so this is where it comes back into preferences is, can we actually modify the voices in ways, not just preferences, but capabilities to understand what the content is such that the audience gets the message and can connect with the brand. So it's sort of, it's hard to describe, but there's multiple layers of what voice means. Do we want our brands to sound like us? I think would be one question I would ask. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we need them to sound exactly like us, but we need our brands to sound like something we can trust. And so, for example, um, if all of our brands are always speaking to us in a particular dialect or a particular tone, that might feel like there's no differentiation. But let's say you are a product where it's really important to, to create a, a social connection, you know, or let's say you are a product mostly focused on the elderly, right? If that product is talking to you really fast and very millennially, it can kind of be a turnoff. Right. And so perhaps we actually have to think also about who the who the listeners are more, not just in terms of demographics and accents and things like that, but simple things like should this actually be said a little louder? Should it be said a little slower? Should we be paying more attention to the way something is said, which is called the prosody of speech, rather than just the words? We think a lot about changing the copy um, or the content for different market audiences, but I think the era now of being able to change the voice is possible. It wasn't before because it required like a whole nother campaign to say, okay, well, how do you modify this for this particular audience? You can't lose the whole idea of a brand voice, but the fact that you can maybe modify that a little bit for different audiences is something that I want to open up a conversation about. Mm, interesting. So I am always so impressed with entrepreneurs who see opportunity in specific technologies, especially mission-driven entrepreneurs. Like you need a, a massive amount of imagination, you know, in order to expand the mission and venture into new areas and business. How did you know it was time to expand? Was there a clear signal? Uh, and how did you know it wasn't just a distraction? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a practical <laughs> aspect of that, uh, of that question, which is we knew the market on assistive technology alone wasn't going to be sufficient for us to think about um, how we truly get uh, adoption here. If we wanted to bring the latest and greatest technologies to those with speech disabilities, we couldn't just sort of build up the voices and sort of wait, right, or create uh, something where we, we sort of park the technology at a certain level. That means you have to continue to have R&D um, and that costs money. Um, so that was one. The other thing is timing. Um, today, you know, it took a long time, actually. We almost had to wait. We were a little early on how, how soon we were talking about synthetic voices. Um, it was before the time. So 2017 was the year of the echo, right? Um, there's more and more market penetration of, of headless speakers today. So I think when we were talking about the fact that custom voices were gonna be required of, of a lot of different voice applications, it was definitely early. So part of the thing about timing is um, you have to either wait or, or quickly react to the market. And I think we thought that this would be earlier. And I, you know, if you have high, hindsight is 2020. If we knew exactly when this could happen, I mean, I think maybe we would have started a little bit later, but there was momentum already in what we were doing in the assistive technology side. So, you know, um, I think there are many distractions. In fact, we had one major distraction um, back in 2018 as we were approached by a large bank um, and who had 
implemented voice authentication systems in, in their um, in their protocols. So basically you call the bank and that's how your voice is your password, right? To get into the bank. And they were concerned that the, the fact that we were making these unique voices for individuals and quickly and rapidly at scale and cheaply too, what did that mean for access to the underlying technology for those who may want to use it for, you know, for unintended purposes, for harm? Nefarious right? purposes. Nefarious purposes, <laughs> correct. And so they approached us and said, could you kind of do these white hacking kind of experiments to, um, to, to see if your voices can break through? And so we did this experiment. It was, um, and it was good money. And so we were like, wow, this is fantastic. Maybe this is this is our next vertical, right? So that we can get the capital to do the other stuff. Um, and we did it. And we also also showed, we also showed that we could break through the voice authentication system as long as if there was enough data that to, to build the voices and also if some aspects of the, uh, the system were sort of tuned in a certain way. And we thought, oh, wow, this is it. Now we're gonna go to every other major bank and we're gonna we're going to build them this uh, tool that they can say is the audio coming into the bank synthetic or is it real? You know, and we had we patented that work and all of this stuff. What we did is with many many conversations that we had. When this was an eight month diversion, um, and when we had those conversations, people were ready to have those conversations. They wanted to learn what we had learned, right? And they wanted to be educated about what we had learned. But at the end of the day, the fraud level was not high enough for them to even implement something that was dirt cheap for them to put to get, like to put into their system. There's so many other things that we don't know about. So you might think you have this awesome solution, an awesome, you know, uh, product, but there's a lot of other, I guess, forces that are preventing the companies from actually putting in this piece of technology into their pipeline, into their workflow. Um, and if they don't need it, and if no one's pushing on it, it's just not gonna happen. So yeah, we've gone down a couple of those paths, but then always return back to well, what do we wanna really do? You know, and, and that's, those are those moments where you have to really ask yourself, well, yeah, I really wanna do it, but how will we, how will we fund it to happen? Absolutely. So lately, voice and voice only, audio only apps have been super hot. You know, of course, I'm talking about Clubhouse and Twitter mm -hmm. Spaces. Do you have a theory about why they are so popular right now? Well, I think that the pandemic has had a really big shift. So I think it's pandemic, but it's also we were primed for this already, given that, you know, the explosion of IoT devices that talk and like voice first was already happening prior to pandemic. Mm -hmm. What pandemic has done now is um, I mean, we, we've been in Zoom rooms, right? We've been trapped in these Zoom rooms <laughs> um, for so long, <laughs> right? And so one of the things is people are hungry for something where they can be out and about and they can have those conversations. You can have the walking meetings and you can have the non face-to-face -face because that sparks a different kind of conversation. Um, I think when you're looking at each other's faces, I mean, there's, there's value to that for sure, right? You can see and you can read people's faces and how is this actually, you know, being understood by people. But oftentimes people, even in these meetings, have their cameras off, right? Why? Because it's hard to be on 24-7, you know, in, in that way. Um, I think the other thing too, though, is when you have just audio, you actually listen in a different way. So I think when you're listening with, with, you know, with the camera on, you're also looking at the scene, you're looking at the facial gesture, you might be attending to something completely different. When it's just audio, your mind and attention can go all to that. So I think that's another reason where we're looking for new ways to interact and new kinds of things to tune into. Um, and I, I think that's part of why as well. Interesting. So getting back to that whole synthetic thing, I'm always so fascinated by this type of uh, story. You shared a story with me about synthetic meat. And I know it's <laughs> yeah. like getting a little far away from voices, but mm -hmm. in a world that prizes authenticity, mm -hmm. how should we think about synthetic options? Yeah. And you know what, Bobby, I've been, we've been thinking a lot about 
Is that the word we should be using, right? Because it is, it has all the negative connotations and none of the good connotations, right? Um, so when you think about synthetic, we have this, um, even synthetic fabric, synthetic meat, anything that's synthetic, we hot, often have this aversion to it and thinking it's not, it's sort of a, a lower class thing. And I think the issue with that is that um, that bias, you think about it just like an implicit bias, shapes how we perceive that content. So there was actually a fantastic report I just read earlier today that was showing that when you don't tell people, if you're listening to synthetic media, 60% of the time, they have no idea. They have no idea. Um, so they'll guess that it's actually a human. Right. And I think that that's like that study was done a, a couple of years ago. I'm imagining it's even better now as the technology improves. And so the, the analogy I was using with you about synthetic meat was that you give someone a Beyond Beef burger, you know, and then put all the toppings on it and stuff. They, they go eat it. They're like, oh, my God, that was the most delicious burger I have had. And then you tell them it was Beyond Beef or Impossible Meat or whatever it's called. And, um, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, the texture was a little off and, you know, I could, there's no real smell, you know, the smell was off and so on. But if you don't tell them, they don't know what they're consuming. I'm not saying the deception part, like we heard in, you know, Google Duplex, people were offended by the fact that they didn't know that they were talking to an AI. But I do think that the bias against synthetic or, artificially generated or you know, bioengineered or whatever you want to call it. And we don't have a really good term for it. I think it is, is something important. The other thing too, is when it comes to synthetic speech, all synthetic, the way synthetic speech used to be created, like for example, Alexa, Siri, all of these um, kinds of voices were developed with a certain kind of technology. You had someone in the case of Siri, a woman named Susan Bennett record about 40 hours of audio um, or more, I don't know. And then that audio was chopped up into little bits, sounds and sound combinations. And then it's recombined and glued together for words that she never said or conflict, you know, sentences that were never said and so on. That's called concatenative synthesis. So it's you're gluing together little bits of speech. In the last five, 10 years, there's been a massive advance in machine learning across all sorts of areas, right? And it, it's also touch speech. And so now the synthetic voices that are created are not created by gluing together little bits of speech. We still start with human speech. So let's say we're making the Bobby voice. So Bobby would record, you'd record for about two hours or so. And it's, um, and that's like, so that we can get about 90 minutes of good, clean audio. We take that audio and we feed it to our machine learning algorithms, which then learn the way you speak and how that's different than some base model of speech is just speaking English in general. Um, and then now when you, we want you to say something new for a new podcast or whatever, essentially the algorithm is re, uh, it's not recombining speech, but it's sort of mathematically modeling what your speech would sound like and creating that. Okay, so it's different than the old method of synthesis. So it's, it's, I think it's, it's more accurate to call it artificially generated than synthesized because the synthetic was referring to the gluing together piece of it. Um, so I don't have a good name and this is where I could, I could totally use your marketing genius to figure out what's that new, what's that name that doesn't have that weird aversion? Huh, interesting. Oh, I would love to tackle that one. <laughs> so, hmm, well. Moving on, appropriately for somebody working in the world of voices, you've done a number of speeches, fireside chats. You did your, you talked about your, your TED. I actually met you when you were on stage uh, down in Rhode Island at the uh, innovation conference down there. To what do you attribute your success on the speaking circuit. I mean, what does the public speaking that you do do for you and your company? Mm. I think because of, um, primarily because of the way we've been funded at Vocal ID, the public speaking actually is 
is part of our marketing in some ways. That's how people get to know who we are. Um, the grants that we have um, don't allow for real marketing. Um, and, you know, so, but our budget in that area is relatively small. And so these talks are a good way to kind of reach a broader audience and more of also a lay audience, right? Because um, we're, we're explaining how this technology can touch people's lives. And by doing that, you actually have to explain through stories what that means, right? And so I think it's really important to be out there. Um, I think the other thing that I've had the opportunity to speak at is schools. So um, often, you know, we have people volunteer their voices for those who are not speaking. And so kids bank their own voices. And actually that is a really interesting way to get kids to learn about disability. It's a way for kids to learn that they have power. They, like, their voice is actually something that could be useful to others who don't have one. And so I've used it a lot as a way to educate people, to motivate people um, about what this mission is. And I think as a mission-driven company, it's important to excite people about this, inspire people about it. And that doesn't happen if you're not out there. Yeah, absolutely. Can you give us, us female entrepreneurs in particular, can you give us some guidance in how we as entrepreneurs should be thinking about artificial intelligence and machine learning as we're building our companies? Yeah, I mean, I think that artificial intelligence, machine learning today is is pervasive. It's, it's a ubiquitous kind of technology. And oftentimes I think that people have this feeling like, well, it's kind of like statistics of the 1980s, right? Like, are we really gonna be talking about those numbers? But underlying almost every application today is an AI, is applied AI. Um, whether we're talking about marketing, whether we're talking about pharmaceuticals, whatever the industry is, there is some underlying technology that is doing prediction and learning. And so I think one of the things that we can do as women is um, demystify it, right? Um, for, for girls and other women and for young boys, and, and not to think of this as we've thought about math and science in the, in the past, right? So I think AI and ML, ML, machine learning, typically are thought of as there, there's this mathy part to it, right? But there is an application side that's just as important Right. So developing the algorithms is one thing, but what are those algorithms going to be used for and how could they be used for things that maybe are, were not intended, good or bad. Right. So there's many ways in which, um, you know, women and girls and, and people of all types can contribute to this. So I don't think it's um, I feel like oftentimes people are thinking about these new advances as very technical. There is a technical element to it. But, um, and I, I definitely think that women can also contribute to technical aspects and we need to be out there on the forefront talking about these things because it can't be seen as something that is a, you know, a male owned topic or whatever. Um, but I also think that the big thing here is identifying the opportunities for where you can apply these techniques as well. Um, and that, you know, those are, very interesting skill set. Um, you know, I don't think those are gender specific whatsoever. Great. When we're talking about artificial intelligence, when we're talking about machine learning, there are all kinds of conversations that are happening around diversity, gender equity, inclusion, when it comes to these databases of images. Is there the same issue with voice? Do we need more diverse voices? Absolutely, it's the same issue, it's a data issue. So when you think about the fact that the models don't, you know, can't really predict um, faces that are non-white, right? Um, or different shapes or uh, different features, it's very similar in voice. Um, so if you don't have enough data of different diversity of voices, you're going to have, you know, the model is going to basically speak, but it's not necessarily gonna speak with that kind of diversity, so absolutely. And that's not just an accent, I would say, it's also in style. So when you think about the voices we hear today, we hear kind of these announcery styles or the promos that we hear on TV, they're kind of like really, they're caricatures, right, of people. But depending on what you're listening to, a lot more of the kinds of content we're listening to these days is much more conversational. So when we're listening to podcasts and so on, why do we listen to those? Mostly because 
they're, they, they don't feel like they're overly produced, even though many of them are. Um, but that gives you kind of a chance to listen to the content and not like the overacting of it. And so that's also really important that the models learn how the speaking styles and the variety of speaking styles and when to appropriately use which style for what context. So that leads us right into, you know, do you need more voices, Rupal? Can we <laughs> give you our <more> voice? <laughs> Yeah, so maybe I'll explain. So the volunteers who contribute their voice to the Human Voice Bank, which is our sort of uh, repository for those who um, are unable to speak, we are always looking for more volunteers there, people of all accents, of all ages, um, and of all kinds of voices. Um, in fact, we're also starting to work with organizations through their employee um, engagement uh, plans and programs to get more voices in, especially in these um, diverse contexts, these companies that are multinational as well. So we'd love more voices. We can only make unique voices if we have unique voices, to, like to start with donor voices to start with. So absolutely, people are interested in recording their voice um, and sharing their voice. Uh, you go to vocalid.ai slash voice bank. And we'll put that link right in the story as well. Awesome. And you, fear not, though, that if you're recording your voice for the voice bank for someone who's unable to speak, you're not. It's not going to end up in like a, on the T or you know, uh, you know, in various places like that. The work that we do for companies and organizations is a separate database. It's a separate process, and we're usually not using. Um, individual people's voices that are, we're not using volunteer voices, we're having voice actors and professional talent do that work. Gotcha. Actually, that that's a great lead into a question about who gets involved in these corporate voice projects and what do they look like? Yeah, in the corporate voice projects, it can, we're still trying to figure that out, to be honest. I mean, one thing we're uh, we're seeing is sometimes it's the marketing team that's pushing to say, okay, we need this this kind of a persona for the voice. Other times, the companies come to us and they say, you know what, um, you're the voice experts. Tell us what our what our customers will want to hear. So we start there with some research on which voices are preferred by which market audiences and so on, and then build the voice from there. Um, product designers are involved often, conversational designers are involved. Um, so there's different roles depending on the industry. Certainly in the customer service industry, there's it's quite well mapped in terms of who people are uh, that are engaged in the voice channel. In the marketing side, so for example, we're starting now to create 10, 15 second long um, marketing uh, copy or audio samples um, that will be in radio or streaming. And for those, the it's usually content designers um, and sometimes the copy editors are involved. So different depending on the audience um, and the market segment is that what we're talking about. Interesting. I, it's funny, I, I worked in radio early on in my career and every once in a while I can hear, I go back into my radio voice. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I'll... WTRY, PIX 106, Albany, Schenectady, Troy. I mean, you know, you, you never lose the call letters. Yeah, <laughs> I, and that's kind of the thing, right? Like, you know, we feel that people are going to have sometimes different kinds of personas that they use. And you might see yourself skipping into that when you do these podcasts or something like that. Um, and we do that every day. All of us do it between who we're speaking with as well. Yeah, not only is it different people's voices, but you all, you, you yourself have many different voices. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I'll hear myself using a different voice talking to the kids than I do using talking to my team. Yep. And that's actually one of the things in terms of when you want copy to come alive, you know, that's what voice actors do all the time is that they are context switching. They're thinking about that audience. How do we endow the artificial voice in the same way to be context aware? That's, that's really you know, the holy grail is emotion and context aware voices that speak in a way that's more natural. There's also this weird uncanny valley. Like if, if things start talking to you in too natural a way, is that going to be creepy, right? So there, it's this interesting balance between how we use this technology and what we use it for. Great. Okay. Any last uh, tips or advice from the experienced academic to entrepreneur <laughs> journey for other entrepreneurs? I would say that, you know, one of the early things when I started uh, on this journey is as a, as a 
an academic, often um, and sort of mid-career, right? So um, I think people think, well, is this, and especially because my company was a, um, was a, was a mission-driven company. And so there were a lot of questions is, is this just another science project? Is this just another passion project? Um, and it's not. And I think you have to continuously sort of, you know, you can either kind of be beaten down by that or say, you know what, I'm going to show them. <laughs> you know, there, there is something behind this. And um, there, that's, there's a passion driving it. There's nothing wrong with that passion driving it. Um, so I think the one thing I say to you know, young people, as well as um, people that are changing their careers midlife is, I don't think that categories and labels are a very good thing for really most things. And so I think the more we can kind of shed those and say, you know, I'm an academic or I'm a speech scientist or I'm an entrepreneur. I'm all of those things and I'm a woman, but that doesn't really matter, right? And so all of these things are who you are, but I think as long as we can kind of shed those walls or those silos, we can take risks that we aren't used to taking. And I think that's actually how we grow and how we, how we continue to evolve who we are. Great. Thank you so much. This is Bobby Carlton, editor in chief of Lioness Magazine. Today, I have been talking with Rupa Patel, founder and CEO of Vocal ID. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Bobby. It was a pleasure to be here.